there's no wrong decisions as long as you're doing something and trying. Yeah. So whether that's like a research field you want to join or like a sport or like a class you want to take, I don't know, the older I get and the more education I do, I realize there's like not a wrong path to take. You know, as like a freshman, you can be very scared, like declaring my major. This will settle my career forever. And you realize, no, it doesn't. (laughs) Dude, I was a music major at some point. (laughs) Yeah. Chris, thank you for being here. Uh, Brief introduction. Uh, Chris is a senior biochemistry major who has earned numerous awards at the departmental level, university level, and even at the national level. Chris is also my lab mate and someone we are fortunate to call a friend. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I'd also like to add that I'm also a friend. <laughs> oh, wait. You said that already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That's so, the tone for this podcast, if you can't tell. Already. Yeah, yeah. This, this is going to be a special podcast. <laughs> So I, I first wanted to mention um, when you worked as an SI, there, I once heard you say you were a professional student um, <laughs> in your own opinion. What? Oh, yeah. I, and, and I actually want to peek into this a little bit. Oh. What makes someone a good student in your opinion? Oh, this is a deep dive episode. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know I ever said a professional student. I don't know how you remembered that. It you was, were, you maybe were, that was an SI training or you something? Said, you know, you as students, that? we're not really experts at anything, but we become pretty good students. You know, we're all seniors <laughs> now. It's kind of like clockwork, honestly. This is our final uh, semester. Uh, and, you know, that's the one thing I would say I'm pretty good at now is being a student. Uh, one of the few things. So what, what do you have to say? Yeah, I think um, professional student, that's what I've always liked is it? doing school and assignments and deadlines. Um, you liked it? Yeah, yeah. I, the growing up, like, I loved mandatory classes because, like, friends had to be there. Like, friends didn't want to hang out outside of school. So then in a classroom, it's like, hey, mandatory hangout time. You had friends that didn't want to <laughs> hang out. Wait, wait, wait. You had friends that didn't want to hang out after school? Oh, well, yeah. Like, you know, growing up, like, middle school and high school can be hard. Like, a little awkward, awkward years. So, like, that's true. school was always a time for, like, mandatory like mandatory hangout <laughs> yeah that's how i always saw it so like aside from just being fun i like something i've tried to be good at with school um i think what makes a good student would be like number one like an ethic for like your work so routine and dedication to getting assignments done what's what's your routine <laughs> or um, like a like one day pick one day like what does one day look like for you i mean I think a good routine is me just starting the day right. I find if I like wake up and like I'm on my phone a lot in the morning or I wake up late or I maybe, you know, you're playing video games too early in the day or like not doing school, like the rest of the day has like a bad, unproductive tone for me. Mm-hmm. If I start the day like early and start studying and like start reading and like making a planner, the rest of the day like kind of falls of in place. Yeah. yeah like even like you know, just this weekend, like, Oh, it's Friday. I have no class finally, but I kind of like lazed off. So the whole day I didn't do anything. I wrote like one line of notes. What and, time do you start your day at? Um, Normally. Not that early. Um, like 8 a.m. <laughs> kind of a funny question. It varies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I probably wake up at like 730. You definitely say that you're one of those people who makes their bed every morning. That's the, <laughs> oh, if you yeah. make your bed oh, that yeah. morning. The rest Dude, of the day. Chris looks like he makes day. his bed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I make the bed. I change the pillowcases every day. You got to make sure you're clean. <laughs> so as an SI, I mean, you, I think you would consider yourself a good student. I definitely would. But when, what do you, like, recognize as an SI or when you used to be an SI or just a student that does a lot of mentoring? What do you kind of recognize in other students? Like, oh, they, they're, they're different. They're, they're being, like, they have a good ethic, like you said. They have a good dedication. Um, there's, there's promise here. I want to help them a lot. Yeah. I think all, every human's like capable of, you know, being productive and like being happy and doing what they want to enjoy. But, you know, that's what school is for is to teach those values. Exactly. So you don't have to like think, oh, college isn't for me or 
higher education isn't for me just because you don't have a good school work ethic and you struggled before in maybe high school or earlier. I think college is a time to learn the work ethic. So, you know. To become that yeah. professional student. Like as much as we're all like biochemists and chemistry majors, um, we're also just learning to be students and learning to have a work ethic. And so that's, that's kind of I, I, how I see school. It's like learning to have good study skills and good work ethic. You know, it's, it's as simple as it sounds. Did, yeah. you, did you ever find yourself like in a time where you were questioning your own like student, I don't want to say student ethics, but like yourself as a student? <laughs> uh, yeah. It, <laughs> you keep like putting me on some kind of pedestal. Like, I don't know. Like, a, <laughs> like well, I mean, you Gandhi are the guest. You're like Einstein. <laughs> like, did you ever question yourself, Chris? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> of course I did. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the same age as you. I'm like 22 years old. There's plenty of moments of questioning. Uh, I guess I mean more like, um, <laughs> did you ever feel, and we'll, at some point we'll dive deeper into this, but uh, as a student, did you ever feel like maybe the routine that you were doing wasn't working out and then maybe you made changes? Or like, was there any point where you were like, this is not helping me as a student, so I'm going to change it? Yeah, I think that's a huge part. E each semester for me, honestly, every time I start a new class and I've had like, a month or two break before the semester starts. I kind of have to get into a new routine of note taking. Mm. So the first week or two of class, I'm always questioning myself, like, should I be writing this down? Is this good note taking? Like, should I be like copying the slides exactly on like a PowerPoint? Should I be asking questions, and writing those down, and like finding answers? Like, I'm always thinking of new note taking strategies. That's my big thing. I, I like taking notes for a long time, like super long note sessions. <laughs> kind of lame, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like yeah i guess like in the zone for that for a long time you're different you like to do like big periods of like work right like you don't like to break it up stuff at least that's what i remember you telling me once eh, it, it depends i mean like i like big, big work productive session. days yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know every two hours definitely take a break eat a snack go outside for a walk that's what i like doing i, I like i live very close to campus maybe like a five ten minute walk so it's very nice how I can walk to my classes. It's kind of a side note, but I like walking to my classes, having a lecture, and then walking back to my home to like eat lunch, and walking back to school to study, and like walk back. So I walk to campus like two or three times a day from my home. And so I, that's what I like doing. It's like always on the move and like staying active in and a it's, way. It's, I mean, the, the <laughs> convenience is like one of the things I really miss about like my freshman year, despite not really enjoying living in dorms. Um, that was a huge... Um, edge that I could have is being right next to all my classes. Um, I want to ask you outside of the classroom now. Um, oh. As someone who literally pays their own bills, it always strikes me how much volunteer service you've done. Um, what motivates you to give back to the community? Uh, yeah, I, I do like volunteer service. I, you know, I did, I did some in high school. I did like Kiwanis Club and other like small student organizations. And, you know, this stems out of a need for, like, filling your application for a college. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to have some a volunteer record and service. And so that's where these things stem from, whether it's high school or college. Everyone needs to get volunteer service or outreach to the community. And we all know that. But it's really important to invest a huge amount of time early on to, like, passion for others. Because you need a, the rest of your life, you're going to be, you know, wanting to help others in some way. So having that kind <laughs> of like um, already some a characteristic. Yeah, that you're like college is forcing you to volunteer. And like it's, it's kind of like they're forcing you to learn classes or forcing you to have a good work ethic. So college is for, it's a structured environment. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I did it for the purpose that you're supposed to be volunteering. And I really did enjoy it. It's a good time to spend your weekends like... I, we should underscore you. You have the uh, presidential volunteer award. Um, like, how do you even get that? How many? What, what kind of work goes into getting? Yeah, that? so I think it's called the presidential service volunteer award, and it's I guess some office from the government, some government office or agency. I think the White House will send you like a letter congratulating you for volunteer service. Oh, this is not a Texas State thing. This is uh, like a yeah. This that was the whole national level oh, thing. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so I think. Uh, it's different for a youth and adults. I think mm -hmm. adults, if you do like 250 hours 
of like tracked uh, volunteer service in a 12 month period, then you can be given this, this letter from the white house. That's like, Hey, congratulations for helping our community, the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's a good goal to have, you know, like, Oh, it's just a quantitative number, 250 hours. Yeah. But like, what do you do in those hours? Well, it's lots of qualitative help for the community, you know. What did you do in those hours? Uh, I think I was a part of a Boy Scouts group. So we did lots of medical events where, uh, you know, volunteering at Special Olympics as a medic. Um, volunteering at <laughs> a church every Sunday. Well, some Sunday. I didn't go every Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> but first day at the church, like mm -hmm. measuring blood pressure for some of the churchgoers and doing their blood glucose. Uh, I help, I also taught a lot of like first aid classes, whether that was CPR or first aid or stop the bleed. But I did a lot of that. Uh, and I also volunteered in a lab for a while. Um, so volunteer can mean, can mean a lot. It can mean to your community and community and your sense of like at your school. So helping out with like a basketball game, I'll go volunteer or the graduation volunteer and pass out pamphlets or even like for the voting polls you can do that that's your school level there's also your community that's at your neighborhood and people that you wouldn't normally see so maybe like some sort of pumpkin patch fair or something at like the local church and that's something you can go help at and meet people that you wouldn't have especially at a college level where you're always college people uh there's lots of different levels and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of your volunteering um, that you mentioned, like the teaching CPR classes, volunteering at the church, that was all related to this org that you're part of or were a part of? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great student organization. Um, I think everyone should join a student organization on campus. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, you know, kind of preaching to the choir. If like, mm -hmm. you're listening to a podcast like this, you probably are already kind of involved. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's true. The one you're talking about was uh, <laughs> it's Medical Explorers where they do a ton of volunteer experience. They even kind of connected you to like, I guess, expose you to that presidential service volunteer award. Um, so yeah, no, no, that's a great organization. Yeah, I think their motto is like, it's a Boy Scout organization. Their motto yeah. is be prepared. Mm -hmm. And so obviously for an emergency situation or helping others, be prepared, I guess, in the sense we're preparing ourselves for the rest of our lives. That way we can continue to like grow up and always care about your community. You don't just like do it in college for a transcript or a resume, but you can prepare yourself for like a lifetime of like community giving. And that's, I don't know, like career wise, I'm hoping to be some sort of like teacher or professor, you know, not, not to get ahead of myself, but that's, that's where I've, I've seen myself develop at Texas State. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking about me a lot. It's kind of weird. <laughs> I, I suppose it is an interview. But. You're doing a good job. Um, you mentioned the lab. Uh, so you, you volunteer uh, in a lab a lot. Um, you've also worked in a lab. Uh, and we actually realized this morning that you've actually been both of our um, like lab mates. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. You used to true. work in Edgar, Edgar's lab, and, and now you're in... Dr. Peterson's lab with me. Yeah, well, first Dr. Edgar's lab, and now Dr. I was Peterson. Gonna say, it's like I own, <laughs> yeah. I own the whole lab. Um, so, um, I'm on a tight ship over there. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you, uh, you know, what, what do you find were some like similarities between the labs that you've seen? Um, maybe some differences. Why you kind of chose one versus the other? Um, like how, how are you? How, what what steps did you make to get into these labs? Oh yeah, into the thick of it now. Mm. Chemistry research. <laughs> um. I feel like when you first join a lab, like I did, you're, you're volunteering as a student. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting paid. Uh, there's also an expectation of you accomplishing great groundbreaking work. Yeah. So I joined Dr. Hoffman's lab. Uh, I know after a summer research experience, at another institution like UT Austin, and that was like phenomenal summer experience where you spend 40 hours a week doing research, you're shadowing, you're doing your own experiments. You're like a big dog in that regard. You're like doing <laughs> lots of work. And so after that, I'm like, oh, research is awesome. What what uh what summer was this? Like what year? Uh it was after my first semester of college. It was summer 2019. Mm, okay. Yeah, I went to Austin for a summer. <laughs> I was paid, and that was the big opportunity. It's like I, I need to pay for tuition. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was already taking out loans for my first few semesters. And so I, I needed to pay off somehow so i 
research opportunities in the summer. It's like a job, basically. It's an internship being paid. And that's why. Yeah. That's why I mean, you have to you have to look for security first. Like, you do have tuition to pay. You have bills to pay. Like, you know, I I think sometimes it's a little bit too scrutinized when like people think about like the aspect of money first. But I mean, like you do have to pay bills. You do have to pay, like you said, tuition. You have needs that need to be met. So I totally get that. Like you first looked at, oh, this is a paid internship, and then you know I'm getting an experience in research. <laughs> look and at I mean, me now. I mean, look at you now. Like you've have all this like research experience, right? What attracted you to Dr. Peterson's lab, the lab you're currently in, the lab you've done most of your research experience in? I would say, um, probably your favorite lab. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, Dr. Peterson's uh, <laughs> been my most recent lab experience. Um, it was the biochemistry that drew me in. Um, I'd worked in organic chemistry labs and analytical chemistry labs. And as a biochemistry major, you don't start biochemistry courses until you're about a junior, like three years into the program. And so as a junior, I'm like, hey, I want to try more biochemistry. I have no idea what this is. I don't know if I even enjoy it but this is my declared major. So I saw he was doing work with pathogens, looking at nutrients and organisms, you know, awesome techniques like cloning and DNA with molecular biology, as well as a lot of protein work he was doing. And so it seemed like a really wide array of like techniques and research area. So I don't know, I just, I had a chat with him and I also had a chat with a different professor that was much more chemistry based, like organic chemistry and synthesis. And they both seem very interesting. And I don't know about you guys, but organic chemistry has always like been the hot, sexy chemistry. It's just like reactions going on, you're making things, there's flask. That's always been like, you know, the cool chemistry to me. And like, it's really interesting. So it's, it's hard to like, I love biochemistry and like life at the molecular level. So it's always been a struggle for me, like choosing, but it's not really a real struggle because you can do both and right. <laughs> it's all, it's all the same. You said you just reached out, you kind of talked to him and, and I, this is actually a good point to make. Um, this is around the time of remote learning, remote classes. Um, you reached out via Zoom. We actually joined the lab around the same time. Yeah, like, we did. I think it was like within a few weeks independently. Like <laughs> I had no idea. I was first, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you followed suit after you saw my success. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> the, the one week of success. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I mean, I remember reaching out. We did a Zoom call. I, I, I mentioned all the time, especially now doing interviews. It's like, yeah, I didn't meet my PI in person until like four months later. Yeah, it was definitely like a good two or three months before I met him. It was kind of surreal because, like you said, we met on Zoom. I, like, interviewed. It didn't interview, but, like, it was an interview. Yeah. You meet with him, like, hey, is this lab right for me? Am I right for your lab? Like, what, what are our goals? And that happened. So I, I joined the lab, and I followed, like, a senior student and their project. And, but so most of, like, the help I received from my PI was, like, via email and via FaceTime and Zoom for, like, several months because of COVID. Uh, I think this was like in 2020, like the fall. And so like you said, it wasn't until like two or three months. Oh, Dr. Peterson is here. And we saw him in person. And like, it was almost a little awkward just because like, oh, I guess we're in person now. It's, it's I don't know. It's like it's seen a pen pal after like I mean, the, the last two years <laughs> have just been very awkward very in general. Yeah. But he's been the most like humble and influential, like recent person for my research career. I mean, for someone who doesn't interact with us very much in person like he's still very involved mm -hmm. surprisingly um like, and certainly now i think he he has classes he teaches in person and yeah. he's always on campus now yeah so it certainly shifted just because of covid well i you know i just brought it up um like how we kind of got started because um it's important to like emphasize like it wasn't people just kind of like showing us how to do everything. A lot of it was independent. You kind of have to figure things out for yourself. And that's the whole going back to learning how to learn in college. You just kind of have to like put in the time, put in the patience, uh, learn techniques yourself, fail. Over, put in the work, put over, in the hours. Over and over again, put in we the hours. We are hungry, we devour. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get copyrighted. Bro. <laughs> yeah, I, I really do agree though. Y'all yeah. want to know something? Mm. I talked to Dr. Peterson to join his lab. 
uh, around the same time that y'all joined. I do, rem- I do remember that actually. Yeah, I forgot about that actually. Yeah, he. Yeah. I mean, he's a new PI. Yeah, he's getting you know starting to get his personnel in the lab, um, undergraduate lab at that point. Yeah, I, I just forgot. It, yeah, know. like right now when y'all were mentioning like yeah, like we talked on Zoom and whatever, and I was like, wait. So did I. I was like, I talked to him I too. I do remember that. Yeah, it's yeah. very funny. I, I was close to joining. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, and I think you would have certainly enjoyed it to an extent, but yeah, I guess it's that niche of like field of yeah. chemistry that's certainly different. To be honest, I was interested in it because it was new. He was new. Because he was new, he had new projects and you know just like a new way of seeing something within the department. And then I knew both of y'all were in there. Um, I think Daniel hadn't joined at the time, but I already knew like people in the lab. So I was like, oh, it'll be like an easy transition to go in. But the research, or I guess at least the project that he proposed to me, wasn't so much like something that I may have been interested in. Just because I wanted more on the chemistry side of things rather than like on the biochemistry or biology side of things like proteins and stuff like that. And it, like right now when you said... um when you were talking about like organic chemistry and the, and the the lab that you joined, like I thought about that. I was like, I think I would have preferred more on the organic chemistry side of things. Yeah, I definitely agree. There's, and now's the time to figure out in your undergraduate, what, what kind of chemistry do I like? It's chemistry, you know, the chemistry student podcast, lots of chemistry to do. It's very, you know, molecular and biochem and organic. And a lot, I think before you get into it, a lot of it feels like blinding, like there's a way out of it. Like you said, you've you've done like three different. You've been a part of three different labs. You really don't enjoy something. It's this is where you figure out what you do do not enjoy. At least a few things. Um, so much like you said out there to do that you just kind of have to like this. Is the problem with you have too many options. It's kind of hard to make a decision. Um, but you just have to. You just have to make a decision and kind of like go decision by decision. Yeah, I guess it's all to say like unsolicited advice of like there's no wrong decisions as long as you're doing something and trying yeah so whether that's like a research field you want to join or like a sport or like a class you want to take i don't know the older i get and the more like education i do i realize there's like not a wrong path to take you know as like a freshman you can be very scared like declaring my major this will settle my career forever (laughs) And We've you realize, all no, changed it, it doesn't. You change Dude, I was major. a music major at some point. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, even if you graduate with your major, that's, you can go get a different degree or you can yeah. get a different job. And it, maybe perhaps in, like, your pre-doctoral training, like, PhD school, you're like, ah, I'm locked in this lab. Now I, <laughs> I'm stuck with this career forever. Well, no, you can go do a postdoc somewhere else and get more training or go to, like, a government policy job. You know, it's kind of like like science itself. Like even when you make experiments and like you do them and stuff like that, mm-hmm. if you get a quote unquote bad result, like it's really not a bad result because now you know you shouldn't do that, and then you make another experiment and try something different. Yeah. So it's kind of like you know what I mean. <laughs> That's so, a good analogy. Yeah. So it's kind of like if it's you try. Yeah. It's 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 information either way, whether it's information going forward or information going forward but in another direction. So it's kind of like if you try something and you didn't like it, well, at least now you know you don't like it. So you're not going to try it again some other time. So now you can try something else. Hmm. That was kind of deeper than I was. I don't know. That, that was, was kind of deep. You got my soul shook a little bit. A little bit? <laughs> Down to my core. Okay. <laughs> I believe part of your responsibility as a good student, you know, is to seek out awards awards for the work that you put in the hard work that you put in and that that shouldn't be like the reason you do those things but um i think it's important for professional development earning your like i guess awards and titles that kind of give you more of a credibility to when you want to do other projects or go to graduate school for example Um, this is you know spring 2022 uh scholarship season coming there are a lot of deadlines approaching um you've earned several scholarships like i mentioned in the beginning um from the department uh when it was like the biochemistry junior of the year or something yeah like junior think, award or, i think i've got like a, a, good, a few like yeah. good student awards mm-hmm. <laughs> very yeah i mean they honestly should just name them that the good student awards because that's really what they're just looking for is to reward the Chris students award. who are putting in <laughs> work and unfortunately a lot of people don't apply do you have any tips strategies that you use to um, apply for scholarships 
get scholarships. I mean, a lot of it is just the work that you put in. Maybe like, you know, where do you find the scholarships that you're looking for? Yeah, I definitely have good tips. Uh, one, look at your university. Texas State has a ton of scholarships. Um, that's why I chose this school. It was the most affordable school in the nation for me. I looked at all the schools. Texas State offered the most scholarships for like entering freshmen as well as like the lowest tuition. So it was a good combination. But Texas State offers tons of scholarships uh, in your college, in your department. Just, you know, so look, look at like the Texas State boss system. There's so many. And definitely to spend like a lot of time on it. Um, I, I did have like, I had like small jobs during college, like simple little instruction and, and other little small gigs, but like 10, 15 hours a week, you don't make that much money. So I, I was spending, trying to spend like equal amount of time writing for scholarships, mm -hmm. not every week, but like, all right, like one scholarship was like the ACS scholars for American Chemical Society. And that's like a very long application. You got to write a couple essays, write about yourself, make a CV that can take like couple of days of like full-time work doing it at least so i would think i'll go to outkick library and like the fourth floor like sit in a little pod and i think i wrote for like just like six hours straight I'm like all right done Damn. and so whenever i do a scholarship i always for me personally i like writing all at once hmm. and maybe coming back like two days later and revising it but i don't really i'm not really a chipper away Oh no, I, I yeah, I'm chip definitely away. a chipper. I, I cannot do that. What, what does that mean? I would just like break it up into chunks. <laughs> like, um, like I can only write maybe like my first paragraph of like, oh, a, like a story about myself. Like, okay, that was good. I'll, I'll pick that up tomorrow or like mm. next week. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, that's another what, strategy. What that's how you should do it probably is like write an outline and like do a mind map and yeah. chip away. But I, I just like putting it all out there and like have it in my head. So it's kind of a bad I don't know. It's, that's my own way. It's however you do it. Yeah. But regardless, to spend lots of time, like, I feel like I've made just as much money from scholarships, probably a lot more than like my time working as a student worker oh, or I work study. Agree. Yeah. So, but to put the time in to find it. So, your institution, I applied to several, like, I don't know, like the scholarship websites that you just find and like they have random scholarships. Those haven't really panned out because people don't know you enough. Yeah. So you get applied to scholarship, people really know you. I think some I did apply for was like for the Boy Scouts. So I got like Boy Scout scholarships because they knew me. But like random places online, at, they work. I've seen like those Instagram pages of like, <laughs> I made $200,000 this year in scholarships. But like, mm -hmm. I don't know how they do it. It's just sheer number. But I tried it like once my freshman year. Did not pan out. Like yeah. you said, they don't. <laughs> and I, if you write really well, they could get to know you. But it's, it's I don't know. I think the better advice is definitely look in your institution. Mm -hmm. Look for like department mentors that know you and places that you've had an impact on. And they, they kind of already can see that and just explain further. The ACS Scholars program is, they have a deadline March 1st. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the program? You've been in it for about a year, right? Yeah, it's been like three years actually. Oh, Ooh. okay. Yeah, so I joined and I was like, tell us about it. I submitted it when I was like a freshman. Um, it's a good program. I think it's it's meant for like students that are underrepresented in STEM and they're on a PhD track. So and it's mostly for all chemistry and biochemistry. So it's not for like medical students or pre-med or pre-health professionals. It's just for like PhD track and it's very clear. Um, not necessarily PhD. Um, it's also just like chemistry profession. So if you mm. if you didn't if you wanted just to get a master's, for example or you just wanted to work as a tech in a lab. It, it supports chemistry careers, but that, yeah. that, that is a good distinction because mm -hmm. you don't need a PhD for Correct. a chemistry career. Correct. I guess that, that's a mindset we all, I kind of have right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've me been too. deep yeah. in PhD applications and interviews. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> yeah, it's a really good program. Um, I joined because uh, it really advertised mentorship, mm -hmm. number one. I think number two, like huge financial support. So they, they'd pay for your tuition, a lot of it. And so the mentors and payment and just like general guidance for like how to be a chemistry student and like succeed. And they certainly have provided that. Um, it was definitely less mentorship than I expected, mm. but it is a, a, a national institution. Yeah. So, and there's hundreds of students in it. So you, they're not really like one-on-one -on -one opportunities. I guess that's not, that's not true. 
there's opportunities and I never really sought after them. Okay. It feels weird to have a mentor like across the country that I don't even really know. Yeah. But let's say it's certainly possible to get connections through it. And another great opportunity is that it gives you lots of internship opportunities. Oh, okay. Specifically for industry. Um, I've had like Exxon and Mobile and lots of like gas companies. And as like an ACS scholar, you'll get like first access to them. Yeah, yeah so we had these companies will like they send us like a spreadsheet, you like put your name on it, and you get like first access to like a guaranteed internship at some company. I think recently there's been like Pfizer and Moderna. And so I thought about doing this this summer, but I guess there's not really much of a, a point for me this summer to do an internship. I think I should, yeah, you should take a break. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, take a break. Take a yeah. break. <laughs> but there certainly are a ton of opportunities for like first access to internships. And so that's probably the biggest benefit is that you can get like a guaranteed summer experience where you make money, have real mentors in person. And that, that's where the mentorship comes in. So I think everyone should apply. I. I didn't know many people that our school that ever received it. And You're I, the only one I know. And I, yeah, and I, I didn't know about it. And how'd you find out about it? It was a mentor I had. Uh, my, my freshman general chemistry teacher it was Dr. Mamiya, mm. and so he helped me a lot with. He helped me apply to my first summer REU. He told me about ACS scholars. He helped me find Dr. Hoffman's lab and Dr. Peterson's lab. Well, Dr. Mamiya was actually my foundation for. Uh-huh. Chemistry. I was a biology major when I entered, and he pushed me towards like chemistry and biochemistry. So definitely find some mentor that will help you as a freshman. Go to office hours. I just go to the office hours like twice a week and just hang out and talk. And he would just email me scholarship links, and I would supply and like get some, not get get others. You know. <laughs> yeah. Is that answer? I don't. I don't know what we've been talking about. We're talking about the scholars. <laughs> the scholars. Yeah, ACS scholars. Yeah. No, you, yeah. you've covered it really well. Um, <laughs> I I honestly feel a little guilty asking you to do an interview with us right now during all these other graduate school interviews that you've been doing. How um, dare you? <laughs> um, it was Nick. I, it was me. Yeah. No. I I I want to touch on your like plans for the future. So we've been kind of alluding like you you are applying to graduate school right now. As am I. Um, definitely take a break this summer. Um, what's your experience been? Uh, what stuff kind of surprised you about the whole interview process or the application process? That was kind of in the fall. Uh, right now it's more interviews, but, um, what stuff kind of surprised you, caught you off guard? What stuff do you think you're, you could have redone maybe? That that is a great question. I think we're, are we, are we all applying to PhD programs? Not right now, but I think that's what I want to do. Like, I'm pretty, I'm like 80% sure. You might take like a year and apply like next yeah. cycle. Okay. Yeah. So I think we're all kind of the same boat of like a professional, like graduate school. I think we're all going to graduate school in some degree. Probably. Whether it's medical school or PhD or the masters, it's all the same application. I think what took me off guard was at first, like how much effort it was. And I, I can say that now because. I was pre-med focused for so many years with like medical explorers and being an EMT. So I thought medical school was like the end all be all hardest application. And for some reason in my mind, I had PhD like beneath that and that I was easier. Everyone kind of gets into a PhD program like guaranteed and like no one's really doing it. And I'm definitely, definitely wrong about that. <laughs> Like applying to PhD school is very difficult because there's no common application, <laughs> maybe for some programs, but you apply to places in California and Texas and East Coast. And it's all different applications that require different essays or different faculty. So the amount of work was <laughs> a lot. I remember we all had like big spreadsheets of all of our schools and faculty and their publications, how much school each paid or stipend and... <laughs> The location, how many years, it was an umbrella program. Overwhelming details that like <laughs> I guess mattered back then. And you know, it was almost like cramming for a class. You just had to learn so much information. It took so long. I mean if that, that shocked me how yeah. involved PhD school applications were. I had no idea. When did if, you start? Like when did you start looking into like these applications and stuff like that? Uh I think it was I, I had a summer program with Dr. Peterson, and so he was pushing me towards graduate school, and I was still unsure. 
And by, by the end of the summer program, working with so many biochemistry techniques and different organisms. Okay, grad school is the way. So I kind of started right in August. Um, so I think you have like August through December to start applying. And it's kind of a gradual process, like attending workshops about what is graduate school. Mm -hmm. And then attending like preview events for like different schools and hearing about them. So it was, it was kind of slow. That's and, definitely how you should do it. Nice gradual, like seeking schools, the programs, looking through those applicants. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Gradual, like just learning and then getting some feelers out, like maybe looking at websites of schools and faculty, getting a huge list of what just interest you. And then like cutting that list down to like yeah. five good schools and five good programs. And then like, okay, five is enough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's honestly so much wisdom that I feel like we've gained from the whole process. Like just talking to other students who've already applied is super useful or you know, faculty that can help you. Um, I mean, I, that's the way you should apply is a nice gradual process and all that. But like for me, it was like a very steep ramp up <laughs> like around October, uh, end of October. Granted, we also had the fellowship that we were applying to at the same time, which actually reminds me, <laughs> um, if you do apply to graduate school, you have a nice project you be able to pitch. Mm -hmm. the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, that's also a great thing to consider, um, mainly because it just kind of prepares you for how to apply to something uh, at the graduate level. You already have to write your personal statement, so you kind of get that out of the way earlier because the deadline is earlier than gra graduate school applications. Um, but I mean, you touched on it. It's a lot of work. Um, I, if you're applying, I mean, consider it its own writing intensive class. <laughs> yeah. That's the best way I could put I like it. The only people that truly understand that are like the chemistry professors and the faculty. Like you talk to anyone else and like, yeah, sure. Applications are busy. Then you talk to like chemistry faculty, like, oh, you're applying for PhD school. They're like, oh, good luck. Like interviews, busiest time of your life. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> everyone's really on your team and like a the chemistry department, they're all like, oh, good luck. I'll get your letters of rec done for sure. Yeah, like, no. everyone wants to help you. <laughs> it's a really good bubble of, like, teamwork. Supportive environment for sure. And I guess I'll, I'll talk about the external fellowships. And that's a, a great point. Like, you don't need, if you don't know anything about PhD programs, they're fully funded. They give you a stipend, so you make money every year, and there's no tuition, you get health benefits. But, like, applying for external fellowships, like, from different government agencies, or different philanthropic like programs, that's a good like experience for like grant writing and applications, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a good skill to do, but like it, it is a weird line of like applying for external fellowships, even though schools are always fully funded. Well, I feel like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Because I haven't done this right, but I feel like if a school, if I'm applying to a school, let's say I'm applying to, I don't know, Harvard. Right. And Where? Harv Harvard. What was that? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what, bro? Nah, I'm just um, so let's say like I apply for their PhD program, one of them. And like you said, it's fully funded. Most of them are, but it's you know, fully funded. And I get a grant to do my PhD. And I want to go to Harvard. Do you think they'd be more inclined in accepting me because they won't be spending money on me? Yeah, the government that, that's will? exactly the reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like, a huge part a, of it. Yeah. A program can have 15 spots. And so each of those spots require some amount of money every single year. Like mm -hmm. Lots of money to the student. So if you get an external fellowship, that's a free student they have. Yeah, And more than that, it's a free worker. Yeah, In graduate school, you're, you're more than a student. You're now a worker for that university. And you're producing results and getting them revenue. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I've learned a lot more about graduate student unions. Oh, There's going to, uh, hearing, going to interviews at the East Coast. It's a huge thing about graduate student unions and graduate students don't have unions all the time. It's a new movement. What is it? I'm kind of, so I think unaware. I, you know, I'm not the expert on unions, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think it's just, it's a way for like guaranteed representation and like equal rights for workers. Mm -hmm. So if you and I were both in the same program, Edgar, maybe one of us would make more money and the other person wouldn't know. Maybe one person would have get abused in the lab have to work more hours. Mm -hmm. Maybe one person would have a harder time and yeah. just be discriminated 
at, at, at any level. So this is kind of like keeping everyone in check. Yeah, so a union will be a check for the university to have to... It's like a teacher's union almost. Yeah. It's, it's Or some sort of worker's union. It's I think it's necessary. It's certainly political and there's all that to deal with. And a vote has to happen to pass one. Yeah. But I think it's, it's a way for students to be seen also as workers. They get paid so much and they work very long hours for many years. It's like a, a huge contract you're signing for a job. And so, y yes, it can sound nice. Like, oh, I have a stipend for a PhD. How wonderful. And it is so wonderful. But there's also the fact of like equal rights to make sure that everyone's getting the same pay and everyone's getting the same access to opportunity in a PhD program. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it never hurts to check. Right? Like it never hurts to have like an external... Yes. I don't want to say an external party, but like that's what it some, is. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like an outside external the party. university uh -huh. to like make sure the program has integrity. Yeah, because then that's how you you know amend things. That's how you hey, this actually has not been working the way we thought it was working. Like we need to change. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I know you're excited for graduate school. Are you worried about anything? Do you have concerns? <laughs> Any doubts? Maybe. I'm definitely excited. I you know. My first week of school, mm -hmm. I like, missed classes, yeah. like, interviews. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I'm like huge senior writers. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm kind of feeling it too as well, the senior writers with the interviews. I mean, my Mondays and Fridays are taken up right now. It, fortunately, maybe unfortunately, the interviews are ending soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like what, do you have any concerns on your mind? I could maybe talk a few about mine. Yeah, I've had concerns and I've also tried to work through them. Mm -hmm. So I, one of them is moving to a whole new state yeah, and a new exactly. life. So working through that, like both financially, but also like family-wise and friend-wise, you make a lot of connections in college. Now you're going to temporarily lose them for a long time as you go to a new mm -hmm. school and make new friends. So it's a happy, sad environment. Yeah. Other than that, I think, I don't know. Yeah, there's lots to be scared and nervous about, but... The more like interviews you attend, the more you reach out and talk to other grad students, I feel like it all becomes like alleviated. Yeah, I, like, that's been my experience as well. I mean, they're trying to they're putting on their best you know versions of themselves in these recruitment programs. By the way, everything we're doing is on Zoom, um, <laughs> so it really yeah. does become even harder to read sometimes uh, other people. But um, I mean, I've just felt like very welcomed so far in all of my programs. Very like. Um, I guess because they know you're nervous. You know, they they know that you have concerns and stuff. Oh, they yes. want to assure you that like this is a big commitment. But um, at least the programs that I'm talking about um, are very supportive and want you to be happy and mm. a productive graduate student, a successful graduate student. Yeah, I think that's all true. Yeah, and I, th I guess one worry is perhaps choosing the right lab. Graduate yeah. students, what five? Graduate school was five to six years. Choosing the right faculty in the lab can seem really daunting, especially you make choose, choosing a school hard because like, oh, I don't know if this is the right school for me. Well, you should take some of your own advice. Yeah. Um, it's almost like there isn't a wrong decision. And yes. again, nothing. it's like in college all over again sometimes. Um, <laughs> like we're, you're going to choose a lab and it's not binding. I mean, not until like much later. It really isn't. Yeah. And nowadays, every school has like laboratory rotations. Exactly. And thesis talks from the professors. There's so much opportunity from the interviews to arriving at the school to rotations. You don't have to make a decision for like years. Like you have like a good like year and a half from the time you're interviewing to actually choose a lab. Mm -hmm. You'll be exposed to so much faculty. So that's also where not, there's not, you know, not, not, not a huge worry. But oh, yeah. you don't know it until you experience all this. It's, it's a, Ignorance is like scary for a while. Yeah, not not necessarily bliss for graduate school. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. The um, hindsight is twenty twenty thing. Like I, I can really that resonates a lot. I mean, last semester just seemed very like stressful. All these minute details that seemed really big at the time. Now we're looking at it and it's like, oh, they changed the stipend. They raised it this year. Or like yeah, there's a lot of stuff that um when you actually sit down and talk, like it's been a big relief. That's actually one thing that surprised me a lot is like even the interviews. Um. They've just been really like laid back. Um, I applied to a lot of Cali schools, so maybe that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. But um, most of it's just been like enjoyable conversations with faculty about my project, my work. Um, they've been very technical sometimes, but 
I, I feel like I can talk more about my research than myself. <laughs> I feel like it's easier anyway. Um, and, 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 but I don't know. I, it's not like typical job interview. Like what are your strengths and weaknesses? At least that, that's been my experience. I don't know about yours. I, I definitely agree with a lot of that. It's, it's not necessarily laid back. It is a professional interview and there's like a semi structure. Yes. But these faculty, a lot of them are experienced with interviewing and they just want to hear about you as a person, as a researcher, as a student. They're not looking to like, you know, nitpick and like kick you out of the program. They're looking to accept you in. Right. So it yeah, definitely laid back. I've, I've had really good experiences, interviews, mostly like 90% good. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. And I've, I've only had one bad experience and the interviewer for a program that I was like semi interested in. And I don't think he even knew my name by the end of the interview. Uh, oh, wow. He would just talk to me. You know, they talked the entire time by themselves and didn't ask about my research or like my name or like, I don't know where I was from. He kind of, they kind of explained a graduate school to me in like the most elementary sense that like wasn't really needed at the time. Like the time to learn about graduate school is before the interview or after the interview, not yeah. during the interview. Like don't tell me like what a grant is and like explain the definition of a grant or the definition of a school. I know what a school does. They teach you like, you know, it was, I don't know. It was, it's hard to come, like, explain like how like belittling the interview felt. It was, yeah. it was very interesting. I was like an established faculty, and I like, didn't really they didn't care about like who I was as a student. And like okay, it was, it was very I don't know how to explain it. It was very funny and like I haven't really ex experienced a lot of like dismissal before in school. Mm -hmm. Texas has a lot of good faculty and professors. This is the first time in a long time I had a very dismissal faculty of like my desires and my educational pursuits quite interesting so be wary of that happened. dismissal in that regard yeah you know, my worst experience was just my computer freezing mid interview <laughs> with the director <laughs> of a program <laughs> that was yeah it never happened before i can't believe i mean i don't know it, it, i mean he, i had his phone number so i just texted him i was like hey <laughs> i'm restarting my Face computer no 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 <laughs> the interview I, well, I, I actually i said hey i could i could call you like you clearly have an iphone i see the blue messages like maybe we could facetime and he's like no just send me a zoom link when your computer's back and it was fine like i don't know when i say laid back of course it's not laid back an interview always goes both ways um so i definitely treated it that way but um my nerves were in i don't know i i, I get really nervous even for like podcasts mm -hmm. Um, oh yeah, right now you're sweating. I am wrenched. Um, no, but <laughs> these interviews, here. like, they're always been very relaxed. That's something that probably surprised me a lot more than than I was like expecting. Yes, um, and I guess something to look out for: the interviewer will always be more relaxed than the interviewee. So just because they're laid back doesn't mean yeah. you can be as laid back as them. You should yeah, be like yeah. one degree or one step more professional. So that, that is something that's like a, like a trap you could fall in, but I don't think anyone would ever, you know, mark you down for being laid back per se. Could you imagine an interview like in the comment section? He like, they just write, <laughs> they look too relaxed. <laughs> they were too, <laughs> too <chill>. happy. <laughs> they, were, they look too happy to join the program. Not burnt out yet. <laughs> <laughs> to kind of wrap up the podcast, um, I just want you to reflect on a few. Yes. Um, you're about to leave Texas State, as am I. And as you are. As when I just kind of know, like, you actually mentioned earlier, you're a bio major. Um, I forgot that I have it written here. It's chemistry to biochemistry. What what was going on there? Like, what was your you know thought process? Like, you, you, you said you were a lot of medical, started bio, then you kind of moved to chemistry and back to kind of in the middle. Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell... I think most students start college. Um, if you're interested in, in biology or like human health, they have a pre-health professional mindset. So you may think the only like career goal is like being a doctor or a dentist or a nurse. And not everyone believes that, but it's the vast majority of students have like, that's the only option. You either go to school to be like a doctor or like a teacher. If you're like biology or chemistry. And that's what I had, but the more you learn, there's so many jobs available as like government policy or an industry or like a startup and like having a job not with any academia institution. So 
I think I'll just say like I chose my major mostly off degree planning and like time to graduate. <laughs> mm. I probably would have chose chemistry, but I couldn't because of like coursework missing or like an extra year to catch up. Yeah. And so I chose biochemistry as like an alternative between biology and chemistry. But I learned biochemistry is not in the middle of those two. It really is its own field. And that's something new to learn. Like, yes, it is biology and you're looking at the molecular level of it. But biochemistry is its own field, and it is so cool to experience and learn. You go into that field thinking, oh, yeah, it's right in between chemistry and biology. That's why I chose it. But really, yeah. it's not. It's, it's its own, like, it spreads mm -hmm. out and, like, envelopes its own. The big onion. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I chose biochem because of the, the courses, especially, like, the later courses, like, that we're taking now, um, mm -hmm. which I've found really, really enjoyable. Hard, but enjoyable nonetheless. Um and and no yeah it's funny because like it really doesn't matter to an extent we have friends we all do very similar research um so it is kind of like what you mentioned those are really important things like time to graduate of course the credits that you can actually use in that degree plan is also pretty important um what mm -hmm. was your favorite class that you took in the department yeah i was thinking about that i would say molecular biology i think definitely I up there for me I probably would have majored in molecular biology if I could. Mm. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good experience to experience a single class that, oh, I want to go to graduate school for molecular biology. Mm -hmm. now. That's the closest thing you could get here, a biochemistry major. Yeah, I think. and they do a really Maybe, good job but, at yeah. it. It's a very like... Shout out Dr. Karen Lewis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the teacher yeah for all that. the faculty, they the do a, a the fantastic class. job at making it mm -hmm. a cohesive program. All the faculty know each other and they coordinate their classes to like be linear. So no, no regrets in that regard of choosing my major. I don't be able to have regrets with their major. That'd be, you know, a little sad. But yeah, I think I'm, I'm looking to the future to hopefully go to PhD school this year and start that next adventure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the the, 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 the Kool-Aid man just walked in. <laughs> what was that? Keeping with the theme of reflection, talk about your tattoos and whether or not you regret them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta call me out like that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, uh, I did get two tattoos last semester. Uh -huh. Oh, he was going through Very it, huh? Spontaneous. And they're they're both science, a uh, research science based. What are they? Describe them to us. Wish we had video today. Yeah. <laughs> I have one on my arm that is a round bottom flask with flames at the bottom and it's boiling a liquid. Did you like? Pretty do you have sick. in mind like what liquid like, really it is? Like, so I guess yeah. I mean, e this one represents, you know, chemistry is cool. I think organic chemistry is sexy. You know, so I'm gonna take that showing. with me. Like whenever I talk about organic chemistry, I'm gonna say it's the sexy chemistry. Yeah, you yes. got that from Doctor. Yeah, Allison. you got yeah, that from Doctor yeah, Allison. My, that's credit to him. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. But also, I think we my, don't plagiarize here. My first, I did an NSF summer research experience at UT Austin. And I'd use lots of round bottom flask to like boil things and like it was really cool. Yeah. So that, that that's what it represents my first research experience. And on my arm, I also have a bat. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> the mammal, like a flying bat. Um, and that's what Dr. Peterson's research. I thought you were going to say, that's what Dr. Peterson is. He's yeah. a flying mammal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I study a bat pathogen. So I never actually touched a bat or worked with them, but you know. The larger scale of my project of like studying this pathogen, uh, it looks at like protecting bats and the environmental cause. There's so, a lot of bats that are than Texas tattooing State. like a yeast on your yeah, arm. Yeah, I couldn't really kinda get weird. like kinda baker's weird. yeast on my arm. <laughs> so I got a bat instead. <laughs> and so, you know, that's a way to remember research yeah. Wait, yeast? and not harp on it forever. That's the pathogen. Oh. A yeast is like a fungus. No, I know what it, <laughs> I know uh, what yeast is, but I was like in context, like why, why yeah. yeah, I got it. I got it. My bad. My fault. Looking where you are now, did you change anything that you would a decision that you made? Say there are no wrong decisions. What do you think? Uh, Thinking about this podcast, I, I guess I'm glad I came on. <laughs> you were like, this podcast hard, actually was a decision. mistake. Yeah, I was booked today. I had this other podcast I was doing. Oh, I'm glad we could fit in your <laughs> busy schedule. Uh, regrets? I mean, come on. I mean, yeah. maybe not regrets, oh. but like, would you change something? Uh, I think I would have actually tried to... I wish I volunteered more 
as a More? senior. Oh, as, as a, a senior. senior. <laughs> I was like, yeah. The presidential word wasn't enough for you. I, I knew it was a trope I always saw as a freshman and sophomore mm. of you got to get all your volunteering done early in your college career, which makes it seem like a task. And I guess as a senior, you are applying to your professional schools. It was hard. And so I wish I would have done a little more. Um, I'm hoping that's what I can do in graduate school. Uh, graduate school, lots of opportunities for that with outreach. And that's why I'm choosing the school I am, hopefully. Yeah. Like diversity. We haven't outreach. talked about that. What, like, what <laughs> is, like, just real quick, because we're I, wrapping I think, up. I think I will go to Johns Hopkins University. Mm. That's one of two I'm interviewing at. So, what's the other one? Uh, it's a, it's a UC school. It's UC Berkeley. Mm. But those would be the two schools. Uh, I don't, I'm from California originally. And I don't plan on going back yet. <laughs> so I think UC Berkeley is just like a fun opportunity to like see a school, amazing faculty, but I don't envision myself going there. Hopkins, I applied to like eight different programs, uh, way too much time. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's pretty confident. I say I'll, I will go there in some program or another. What would you tell your freshman yourself, Chris? Run. Run? No. <laughs> <laughs> Run away. Um, advice to my freshman, Chris. Your inner child. Um, I, I would say just, yeah, keep getting involved as you are. I did that correctly. I think I, my first week of school, I went to like three different student organizations, just like pre-med society and like medical explorers, and like a biochem society. Like checking it out, like what are these things? And like I didn't stay at all of them. I didn't do much Balkan society, but do that. I don't know, advice? That's so hard to your former self. Maybe I don't know. Maybe like grades aren't everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely some good advice for a freshman. Because I mean and they're but told it's, it's very it's important also as a freshman. advice because it is really important to get good grades. Well, I think especially as a freshman, you can slack off really easy. But I think I went into like very like I don't know. It's hard to say. That's what I was gonna say. Like you can make a distinction because like I feel like everybody in here is like I I'd consider us like uh, overachievers. Like we really like try hard. Yeah, we're all high uh, achieving, like, yeah, high achieving that students. Want to but I feel job. like at some point in our undergraduate career, like I'm sure we've all had that point in time where we're like my grade is not good enough and it's an 87 mm -hmm. or like something like that and i think like once we put ourselves into that mindset we forget that a lot of the students here like are wanting to pass and then we're complaining for an a which again different goals different mindsets but like you said at the end of the day like a grade is just a number and like you know there's other important things like volunteering like research like leadership and all these other things that maybe won't make a B look that bad at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that is a balance between science and the score you receive in a course. Yeah. There's like an Albert Einstein quote I was like looking at yesterday. And that's how Albert Einstein did do so much physics and cram for exams so much. By the end of the exam, he'd be sick of science and couldn't look at that scientific problem for like a year. Mm -hmm. You have to wait. And like Albert Einstein was a great student and phenomenal. Like contrary to popular belief, <laughs> he's, always, he's always a good student, but he sometimes butted out with the professors and he, he didn't like cramming for exams and having like expectations of like how science should be done when he maybe wanted to search science his own way. And so I think I would tell my freshman self, like, think about the science always at its core. Like science is a scientific method and that's what it is. That's all it is. That's all it is? Yeah, and the, the, the grades are a mark of how that professor decided to grade you. So it's not a, a measure of the science being done. That's a great way to end it. Chris, thank you so much for coming. You had a lot to say, maybe a lot more than you thought you did. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. I, I've always been a fan of the podcast. I haven't <laughs> listened to it much. <laughs> I haven't listened to it at all. I, but I've listened, to, I've listened to some parts, and it's good to like put on and hear. I guess... I haven't listened to it much because I talked to you both so much. And so I feel like I'm not. And yeah, but I think I'll, I'll go back and listen to some of the older ones. <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> don't, don't feel bad. Well, I'll thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to this one. <laughs>